case of microsurgery, so if you do need surgery, and not necessarily the big surgeries with the hardware, the screws and the rods and fusions and everything else, it's all done with microscopes. But we're combining that with a new field called regenerative medicine. Regenerative medicine, more commonly referred to as stem cells, PRP, platelets, and so forth. And this is a very, very rapidly evolving field for about the past 15 to 20 years for humans. Uh, the veterinarians have been doing this for a long time before that, and before that it was the military that were treating a lot of the first Iraq War veterans who had major injuries with muscle loss, skin loss, limb loss, and so forth. So we learned that our bodies have the capability of healing itself at all ages and in all different conditions, except there's things that occur or don't occur that kind of prevent that, and we're learning how to kind of turn those keys on so that our immune system can actually regenerate totally worn out tissue, including damaged nerves, spinal cords, and stuff like that. There's over 1,800 doctors in the country today that are doing forms of regenerative medicine, and we'll talk about a lot of the, the advances that we're making. The third part of it is the area called functional medicine, which is Dr. Mark Hyman from Cleveland Clinic. He developed his term. Uh, and it's basically trying to replace prescription medications with natural supplements, particularly IV therapies. You hear about Myers cocktails and glutathione and NAD plus, and now more recently ozone therapy. So I'm doing all of those, okay? So it's a continuum of taking the patient that I commonly refer to as going from the wheelchair to the golf course, and they're 75 plus years old, and it works, okay? So we're gonna go ahead and start, and I'm first acting, asking how many people feel like this guy here, okay? <laughs> so this is kind of an overview of uh, a current understanding from a surgeon's perspective. I'm not a family doctor or pain management doctor. Uh, I am a board certified surgeon, still doing surgery, did a big one yesterday. Um, so we're gonna talk about that. And before we start, People say, well, you know, how does all this happen? You know, I, I, I look at my x-ray that the doctor took and it looks like, you know, I've, I've been in a war zone for the last 20 years. And you kind of have, because it all starts with this structure called the intervertebral disc. You all heard about it, you know, the discs in your spine, you slip the disc, a rupture of the disc, herniated the disc. Well, it's the structure, oops, I'm sorry. This is a new gizmo. So it's the structure that sits in between these vertebrae. So this is a side view of your lumbar spine. And most of what we're gonna be talking about is the lumbar spine, which is the bottom part. You have the thoracic spine, which is where your ribs are, and then you have the cervical spine, which is your neck. And then you got the 15 pound bowling ball sitting on top of that little <laughs> stick, okay? And um, the disc has two major parts. It has these, and this is a cross section of a model showing what it kind of looks like. And this structure is called the annulus, and this is a cadaver um, uh, image of what that looks like. And then the center part of it is called the nucleus. That's the sponge, okay, that's what absorbs fluid. Uh, and on the MRI scan in this particular view, it's called a T2 weighted image, it shows up as white. So we're gonna see a lot of white in our discs. That tells us it's a healthy disc, it's a hydraulic shock absorber, and we're bouncing down the roads and the golf courses and the basketball courts, and our discs are all doing what they're supposed to do very nicely. <clears throat> and the function of the disc is to oppose gravity. I'm gonna say this right now, gravity is not our friend, okay? Because when we went from walking around on four legs to two legs some millennia ago, everything changed because suddenly, instead of everything hanging off our spine like a dog or any other you know, four-legged animal that's all in the belly, now suddenly everything compresses down. And when it compresses, everything starts to squeeze together. And what will start to happen is that if we're not careful, the outer rings of the disc, this annulus, can start to tear. And if you look at it closely, it's not a solid structure, it's a laminated structure. There's thousands of bands going in all kinds of different directions, but they only go six degrees, because it's not elastic, it's not a rubber, it's not a rubber band. It, it allows to torque one way, the other way, up, down, 
only six degrees. You go beyond six degrees, something tears. It's a very similar structure to the meniscus in your knee or the cartilage in your knee, a torn or cartilage, usually because you, 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 you plant and you twist, it tears that structure. That is the beginning of all the stuff we're going to show you. Because the um, <clears throat> outside rings of the disc, I should also say that the inside of the disc doesn't have a blood supply and it doesn't have a nerve supply. So you're going to ask, well, how can anything live in our body that doesn't have a blood supply? It does that by a very complex chemical reaction, it's called active transport, that pumps fluid into and nutrients and oxygen and so forth um, into the disc at night when we sleep. So when we're horizontal, there's no gravity squeezing all this fluid out back or back into the bone above and below. And so um, if that fluid doesn't stay into the disc space and so forth, it'll start to, to leak. But I'll tell patients many times, you, you, when you go to bed, measure your height and measure it first thing in the morning when you will wake up. Because you have 23 discs in your back and every one of them is sucking up fluid and squeezing fluid out. So our spots are like accordions, okay? And what will happen is that if there is an injury to the disc, that fluid can leak out and irritate this guy right there. That's called the sinus vertebral nerve, okay? And what does that nerve do? Causes the most horrible back pain that you can have, okay? And if that nerve is, is irritated and inflamed, it will communicate with the big nerve coming out of your spine through this thing called the gray communicans, and that will cause the spasm from hell. And if any of you ever had it, it'll take you down for two or three days. You can't move, okay? All right, so, and this again, how the nutrition works is that the, there's a, little, a lot of little blood vessels in the bone side of the disc that pump all of these little nutrients into the disc space. So normal disc hydration, again, shows up on the MRI scan as a nice white disc with these kind of black periphery, which is the annulus that we see right here. So this is a beautiful disc. You, all of us want our discs to look like that. These happen to be our core muscles. This is down the lumbar spine. You've got two sets of core muscles in the back, two in the front. These are the paraspinal muscles. These are the um, psoas muscles or the flexor muscles. You know these more as the filet mignons. These are your strip steaks. <laughs> and if I cut you in half that way, that's your two bone steak. <laughs> the fact that these are real dark, that's muscle, that's protein. Okay, that's good stuff. I'm going to show you some a little bit later where you don't see it have a lot of muscle uh, left and it's mostly gristle. Remember you have stick strip steak where you sit there and you chew and chew and chew and you can't get the thing down your head and just throw it away. Well, our spines, our muscles are very similar to that as well. So this is the foundation for everything we're going to be talking about now because there's these are two x-rays, okay, this is our 30, 20, 30 year old. You know, these are the vertebrae, lumbar spine. Here's the disc spaces, sacroiliac joints, because the whole spine sits on this bone called the sacral bone, which connects to our pelvis. And then so our whole upper body connects to our lower body through the lower lumbar spine, okay? So, and, but over a period of time, and it could take five, 10, 20, 30, 40 years, this kind of thing happens. It goes from here to here. Well, how the heck did all that happen? Okay. Um, so the two things I want to kind of differentiate is the difference between back pain and nerve pain. Okay, because they're two different whole animals. Okay. The things that can cause back pain primarily involve the muscles in your back, those core muscles I just showed you, the bones, the vertebrae themselves, the facet joints. The set joints are little joints in the back that connect vertebrae right together. And uh, the disc spaces. And there's also ligaments that connect bones together. Nerve pain, on the other hand, sciatica, radiculopathy, neuropathy, spinal cord compression, neurogenic claudication. These are all symptoms that describe that unbelievable pain at times that starts at your waist and goes all the way down. So let's start with the back pain and the motion, and the spinal motion segment. And, this, and again, the, our, our spines on average will have 
24 vertebrae, 23 discs, 42 facet joints. Now these are real joints. Now they're not fake joints, they're like your fingers, okay? And they have a capsule and they have a synovium and they produce synovial fluid. And, and there's, each vertebrae has two sets of those in the backside. There's the ligaments then in between the bones that hold the bones together, the muscles that we talked about. Then of course, you get these things called nerves, okay, or spinal nerves that come off the spinal cord. So the spinal motion segment, again, is the vertebrae above, below. This is a facet joint, okay? This is the spinous process, or I call it the dinosaur bone. It's important because that's where a lot of muscles attach to that allow you to bend backward, turn, twist, or move, or whatever. And then, of course, there's in between the dinosaur bones are ligaments, and in this case, these are the interspinous ligaments, and there's the supraspinous ligaments, and then the ligamentum flavum. Okay, these are all terms that many of you who have had MRI scans or CAT scans, and you get the report, and you're reading the report, you say, "What the hell is that? What's ligamentum flavum? You know, what's annular tear? What's you know, you know, all these words that really describe all of these." all of these anatomical structures that are either injured, normal, or in the process of wearing out, okay? So, and these are the representation of the paraspinal muscle. That's, a lig that's ligamentum flavum. It connects one lamina bone to the other lamina bone. Lamina is the backside of the circle of each motion segment called the spinal canal, and that's where your spinal cord nerves are, okay? And so you, you've got these precious structures that come from your brain to your brain stem, to your spinal cord, to the nerves that control basically everything from your neck down that are in this very tenuous <coughs> environment. And they're all sitting inside of a sac called the dural sac or the dural tube. Uh, and it's filled with fluid called spinal fluid. And so our brains and everything are floating in this natural shock absorber environment. And that, that works really well as long as the spinal canal is wide open and there's nothing in that spinal canal that we're going to talk about that's pinching those nerves, okay? But we're still talking about back pain. So we mentioned before the degenerative disc disease cascade goes from starting like this to ending up like that. And you see, you can see here now the laminar, all the different bands of the annulus. And again, that's the annulus is the outer ring and the nucleus is the cushion, the sponge in the side. And Usually this happens because you do something at some age, and it could be one incident, it could be repetitive injuries over and over and over, where you go beyond that six degrees. You go beyond that six degrees, something tears. And the tear starts to occur inside of the disc toward the annulus. Now here the nucleus is tan, now it's red to kind of you know, augment it. But you can see now how this, is when you sit, stand, and walk, compress down, gravity is pushing this thing through that part of the annulus. And, on your, on, and you can see that on the MRI scan, it shows up rather than a nice bright white, it starts to turn dark or black, commonly referred to as black disc disease. Okay, radiology, you know, whatever. Until eventually what starts to happen device too, I'm just getting used to it. Um, it will finally kind of collapse down, you'll start getting a lot of bone spurs, here's the facet joints in the back, and here that circle is the spinal canal. So here on the model, that yellow represents the sac of nerves. And it's like, you know, the, you know, the long skinny balloons that clowns make animals out of. It goes all the way up, spinal cord, the nerves, and probably as important, all of the little blood vessels that travel with them because nerves have a voracious appetite for oxygen, nutrition, glucose, protein, because that's how they live. And they don't get that, then you got a problem, whether it's a stroke or whether it's a pinched nerve or it's a pinched spinal cord in your spine. Okay, so we're on our way. And so what starts to happen then Here's kind of the most normal looking disc on this side view in an MRI scan. Here's the spinal canal back here, okay, see that? And all those little gray things, those are all the nerves that come off the spinal cord inside of that circle. 
But you have an injury and it tears the annulus and many times it can have some bleeding with that. Because if that tear ends up going all the way through to where those nerves are in the end, all hell breaks loose. Because then you'll get the spasm, the cramp, it'll take you down. You're in an emergency room because you're crying with severe back pain. Okay, we're not in the legs yet. This is just the back and these structures. And <clears throat> what eventually will start to happen is that that fluid is leaking out, it can't get reabsorbed. And so what will happen, the disc space starts to collapse, like letting the air out of the tire. Try letting in half the air out of the tire, front tires in your car, and see how steady it feels. And what will happen is the outer walls of the disc will start to bulge, you know, and it's like, again, a radial tire. And the thing can start to wobble, it can start to move and shift. It can cause, I'm sorry, yeah, I keep going. It can cause your vertebrae to kind of shift out of place, okay? And when that happens, it's, it can be unstable. In other words, the thing will be wobbling back and forth. Now, you wonder why sometimes when a doctor's order x-rays, or in my case, in, in, when I order an MRI scan, I order, it's, it's the company is called Stand Up MRI, and it's a weight-bearing scanner. So when you go there, you sit, and the coils are on the side, you're watching a movie, but it's a weight-bearing scanner, so I can see how your, your spine changes and all these structures change relative to what position you're in. Whether you're sitting, you can also, we can get it laying down, <laughs> plus I can have them have you bend forward and bend backwards, and you'll see how the significance of that is important for me trying to determine what the heck's going on with people, and more importantly, what do we need to do about it, okay? Because it's not one size fits all in spine. Or maybe some other things, but not that. But what will start to happen is that this space collapses down, and eventually what will happen, Mother Nature will fuse all of these <coughs> discs together naturally. So fusion is Mother Nature's solution to this problem that she created by letting us walk around on two legs, and it's what's been done for thousands or maybe even millions of years before there were orthopedic and neurosurgeons operating. There are probably some cavemen around there whacking on it with a club or a stone or whatever. So, but you know, that, that is the reality that we all face. So sometimes it's a question of hurry up and operate before it fuses itself, okay? Or is there another option that we can look at? And uh, so again, we'll move on. Now what do we do? Diagnosis, well, history, physical, we do some blood tests, we get some x-rays, MRI scans. Discograms um, aren't done that commonly. I still do them. But here's an example of a side view. And you see, these are the nice normal discs they all are like. Now you see this guy down here. That's L5S1. That disc space is collapsing. It's a dark disc, black disc. So there's annular tears, and there has been injury to the disc as this thing starts to collapse down. Now, as this also happens, then, the facet joints in the back. Okay, we talked about the joints, the ligaments, the muscle. If the force that created that tear to begin with in the first place is sufficient enough, it will tear through the facet. Or worse, it'll fracture the facet. Now, these are my golfers who, when they were golfing younger, they were doing this and this, and now we're doing that. And they're compressing down, and that jams the facet, the facet breaks, the capsule of the joint, which seals the joint tears, the synovium inside of the joint, which produces the slippery oil, you know, that when you break open chicken bone joints and stuff, that, you know, it's real slippery. Our joints produce that. That fluid is very acidic, very noxious to the tissues around it. And when you go to the doctors, they say, oh, it's facet syndrome or facet arthritis. They do facet blocks. They do radiofrequency ablations of the facets. Okay, so facet is a symptom of another problem that started in the disc. Now, if it still is sufficient enough, the ligament in between the spinous process bones in the back here, they can tear. And then ultimately the muscle can tear. So you can see the etiology of what is causing the pain. It certainly could be only one problem, but it's usually a combination of all of these things at each motion segment. 
you got 23 motion segments in your spine from your neck all the way down. So now you got an idea of the complexity of spinal medicine and surgery is trying to fix this all up. And that's why there's so many different doctors who are treating people with back pain. You have orthopedic surgeons, neurosurgeons, pain management doctors, chiropractors, neurologists, rheumatologists, uh, doctors of oriental medicine with acupuncture and all kinds. And people don't know where to go to, who to go to, and who to trust or listen to. So, you know, they end up making decisions sometimes they wish the heck they did. So one of the reasons, again, I do this is to educate you people that, you know, you need to make intelligent decisions and don't be afraid to ask doctors questions, particularly the surgeons. And a lot of people say, you know, the surgeon came in, spent five minutes with me, said I need a fusion, went on to see the next patient, and nurses or not even nurses, aides come in to answer any question. <coughs> Don't do anything like what I'm doing right now. Okay, so I feel an obligation as a, as a physician and a Hippocratic oath do what I can to help you make a decision. And then if, if I can help you, I'll say, okay, this is what I would do. And I give you the information to understand why my approach is maybe different or better than another approach. And you can decide for yourself. You go online, you research, you can find that there's all kinds of search engines out there that talk about all doctors and their ratings and all that kind of stuff. That's meaningful and, and, and people over here appreciate that. I've always loved the Naples audience because you're very educated people and you love to continuous, continue to be educated. So, all right, so um, the causes again are that nerve that we talked about and we can also get pain from facet arthritis or facet injuries, fractures, muscle strains, weakness, whiplash injuries, uh, posture changes, we're going to talk about that ligament tears, and then what happens since that ligament, or since that motion segment's not working normally, then that makes the one above it and the one below it not work normally either, because now the forces, you know, the way Mother Nature works is every one of those 23 motion segments are designed to work together, but if one kind of kicks off, then the other ones have to pick up the slack for when that one you know, stops working properly. So uh, again, it's oftentimes necessary to have to do all these different tests, x-rays, MRI scans, uh, CAT scans. I do these discograms, which you know, we can talk about that maybe a little bit later, or question and answer. But that's a test that it's a provocative test that I do that put a needle into the disc to see if that reproduces the pain that they're having. Um, Okay, so again, over time, what will start to happen, it'll start to spread again to adjacent levels. And, um, and here's an example of Mother Nature fusing this disc naturally. Now, interestingly, these still look pretty good up here. But as these disc spaces collapse, they can collapse straight down, or they can collapse on one side if the tear was on one side. And then when that happens, then the whole spine goes off this way. And unless I move to West Virginia, you know, something else has to kind of happen to get my head, my, my bowling ball back over my pelvis. So what Mother Nature will do, our bodies, is they'll start to contract those big core muscles to pull my upper body back over, and that's what has happened here. So if I follow this all the way up to the head, the head's going to be centered right over the pelvis here. But in the process, He's, this patient has developed what's called a degenerative scoliosis. Now we're going to be talking about all the S words in spine, particularly you know, spinal stenosis, and scoliosis is one of those. <clears throat> and you don't get arthritis in the disc spaces. That's called spondylosis. You get arthritis in the facet joints, which again are in the back here. Now you can see these joints. There's the two on the bottom, the two on the top. And you can see, you know, that there's this kind of bumpy looking, uh, irregular appearances. That's osteoarthritis, just like in your hands, just like in your knees. Osteoarthritis is wear and tear arthritis. It's not rheumatoid arthritis or any of the arthritis associated with autoimmune disease like psoriatic arthritis. <laughs> you see advertised on TV with your mirror and everybody, you know, happy and dancing because of <laughs> psoriatic arthritis a long way. Um, but, 
This is a progressive condition. It just keeps getting worse and worse. Now, it all may quiet down. You can take your leaves, take your Advil, take your Celebrex, take your Meloxicam. You can take your Medrol dose packs. You can take your Tylenol. And God forbid, and it shouldn't happen in this day and age, your narcotic painkillers, okay, to treat all of these problems. It just keeps going and going and going and going. And most of the time, we don't know this is happening. Pickleball, you know, or playing golf, or out there hiking and you know, walking ten miles a day, cycling a thousand miles a year. <laughs> you know, star patient, isn't it? Really? Um, <laughs> um, uh, but you know, it's it's life. <clears throat> but it starts to slow you down because it, it hurts. It's painful, and <clears throat> you know, it's hard to live you know, with that kind of pain. <clears throat> So again, we talked about end-stage disease, motion segments really failing at this point. The joints aren't working. There's hardly any motion occurring here because basically it's fused naturally. Treatment options, of course, there's pills, you know, chiropractics, physical therapists. Um, they have all of these different modalities to try to keep you know people number one flexible because as as this stuff happens, you get stiffer and stiffer. You People say, get out of bed in the morning. You know, I, I can hardly move, and it takes me five or 10 minutes to get going until that synovial fluid is getting pumped into the disc space and loosens this up. You're seeing places now emerging a lot called stretch therapy centers. And that actually all started on the west coast of Florida here, up in the Sarasota area, Dr. Aaron Mattis. He's kind of the father of stretch therapy. He wrote the textbook on it. He has therapists coming to spend uh, time with them to become certified as a stretch therapist. Uh, these therapists will stretch every joint and muscle in your body. They start with your fingers, every muscle, and then they wear all the way up the arm and the other arm. It takes over two hours for them to do this. Okay? Physical therapists, you know, they emphasize and do a lot of stretching, but it's usually done in, you know, in conjunction with other modalities and things that they offer, like ultrasound, laser therapy now, vibration of the devices that, that, that try to pump on the muscle to break a lot of these localized spasms and things. They're trying to maintain your posture so you're not walking around like this all the time. Okay, so therapy is a very important part of, of, of the therapy because even if you advance to more either invasive procedures like surgery or some of this regenerative stuff, you need to be able to exercise you need good posture, you need good core stabilization, you need everything kicking in to be able to get you back on the golf course as we talked about or the pickleball court, you know, at age 80. And it happens. They have all kinds of stories. But there's the other invasive procedures. I'm not going to get into all these things. Steroid injections, intradiscal injections. Uh, then, of course, surgery uh, is the... <coughs> box in the corner of the algorithm that means you failed everything else and now we're looking at surgery. But more and more, um, this is becoming very uh, popular and people are very interested in it. So that's kind of the overview of what causes the back pain, okay? So let's talk about nerve pain here now a little bit, okay? And <clears throat> it's usually associated with low back and or extremity pain be one or the other, it can move back and forth, it can be both, you may not have any, okay, it just depends on where the nerves are getting pinched that is causing the pain. Commonly called sciatica, radiculopathy, neuropathy, neuropathic pain, and so forth, and it's caused mostly by a condition called spinal stenosis, okay, but it also can be done from chemical irritation, that fluid that I said leaks out of the disc space, that fluid comes in contact with one of these big nerves that are going right through the opening where the disc is, that nerve will experience sciatica even though there's nothing in there pushing on it. It's called chemical sciatica. Um, if there's a condition where there's not enough blood flow to those nerves, we talked about how important it is, the sac of nerves has all the little blood vessels traveling with the nerves, okay? Um, and of course, things like infections, virus infections, bacterial infections, 
uh, and maybe deformities, okay? This is probably less than 1% of the conditions that can cause stenosis, okay? Now, I call spinal stenosis angina of the spine. Just like your heart, you know, you know, blood, chest pain, shortened breath, heart attack. If it happens in your head, it's a stroke or a TIA. If it happens in your back, it's spinal stenosis. And here you can, here you can see, this is a side view again. Here's our spinal canal, here's a vertebrae, there's some discs in here, here's the backside. But you see this right there, okay? So when we start ordering tests because I've got this pain zinging down my leg or I can hardly walk or my foot feels weak, or I'm slapping my foot, it drops, stuff like that. You know, usually it's pinched nerves. So we gotta find where the nerves are getting pinched and let's see what we can do about it. But that's what it is, is you're, you're squeezing the blood out of the sac of nerves or each individual nerve, just like if you take your finger and you squeeze it together, as you can see it, my fingers turn white. And if left like that for 24 hours, that tissue's dead. So I bet so. But you can see, if I do that, it turns white, but as soon as I let go, it pinks right back up. So if you're in a position, in this case, standing up straight, doing something at the kitchen, cocktail party, whatever, and that nerve is in this, then just bending forward a little bit, opens it up, blood flow comes back in, feels better, until I stand up again straight, okay? That's called neurogenic claudication, okay? It means nerves not getting enough blood. And the symptoms of stenosis, it can be certainly back pain, leg pain, but also numbness, tingling, weakness, balance problems, bowel bladder dysfunction, and again, because if we bend forward, the backside of our spine opens up, allows the blood flow to come in and it feels better. But then you're walking around like this. Mm -hmm. So next time you're at Starbucks or whatever, looking at people, you can say, here, that guy's got spinal stenosis. Mm -hmm. All right. And it could be any combination of these things. Okay. Now, it's not a condition in and of itself. It's the result of something creating a stenosis. So spinal stenosis is not, yeah, I've got spinal stenosis, yeah. But what's causing the stenosis, okay? So when we look at the spinal canal, thank you. When we look at the spinal canal, here's our, where our circle's supposed to be. And you see all this black stuff here? That's all arthritis, bone spurs, thickening of that ligament and flavor, yellow ligament thing, uh, fractured arthritis of the facet joints here. All of that stuff accumulates over years and years of wear and tear, all going originally back to the injured disc. And then there's an area in the spine called the lateral recess, which is the space under the facet joints. And then there's an opening where the nerves are coming out called, called the neuroforamen. Uh, and normally you should see the nerve in that opening. You can see the nerve right there, right there in the white around it is, is a fat, okay? That's supposed to be there. But you see this one's all black, okay? When you see this, there's a good chance there's probably instability of the spine. You're in that middle phase where the vertebrae are wobbling back and forth. <clears throat> okay, causes of spinal stenosis? Well, one of them is called a synovial cyst. And that's not the sac of nerves. That's a big balloon that coming out of this disc, I mean, out of this facet joint, because there's a big fracture right through there, right there. And uh, so, so synovial cyst can cause narrowing of that circle. Okay, but it should be a nice big white circle. Another one's a big herniated disc. See that big thing sitting there? That used to be inside the disc space here. And that blew out, and you can see the nerves here just getting crushed. Okay, herniated disc. And that's again our friend, the thickening of the ligament and clavum. This is facet arthritis. You can see all these bone spurs and all that stuff right there. And here's our friend, the spondylolisthesis. Everybody loves that one because nobody can pronounce it, let alone spell it. That's the vertebrae that's shifted out of place, and that can pull the whole upper spine forward, and it acts as a guillotine to compress the nerves and create a stenosis. And then of course, 
the bullet up the backside by a jealous husband can cause stenosis too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Any guys in here you know, hear uh, clear their throats? Uh, all right. <coughs> jealous husband. Mm -hmm. Now we talked about you know the how stenosis is affected by what posture you may or what position you're in. And this is why I like the stand-up MRI scan, because this is a sitting MR with the patient bending forward and the pendulum being backwards. Same patient, same situation. But see, when he bends forward, it's, there's a lot of white back here, white is spinal fluid in the spinal canal. And you can see these gray things are all the nerves inside of that sac. But when that patient bends backwards, look what happens. Here, here, here. You'd miss that if you didn't were able to take the flexion or extension in here. Okay. So um, again, we have a lot of options available to us from a diagnosis imaging standpoint. Here's our algorithm again, treatment medications. If that doesn't work, we go to physical therapy. If that doesn't work, you usually go to the pain doctor. You get into cortisones and the facet blocks and the epidurals and and up until recently, it was a major problem until the FDA stepped in and said, we're putting way too much cortisone in people, but they're going to be fine. Because cortisone can also cause everything we're talking about here. It shuts our immune system down. And our immune system is continuously trying to heal and replace worn out damaged tissue. But it hurts, causes inflammation. It's your body's way of telling you something's wrong, but we don't want pain. We got to keep going. We got to keep going. Pickleball tomorrow. You know, so we take our Advil or leave and our you know, hydrocodone, maybe. Um, but, you know, more and more, the, the state medical boards, the, the DEA, the United States, all those doctors have to take courses now every year about mismanagement of pain and how better ways to do that. But that's, that's another whole discussion. But this is called an algorithm. Okay, we're treating spinal stenosis. And all this has failed, and there's always that box down here in the corner nobody wants to be in because it says spine surgery. Whoa. <laughs> okay. And people are scared to death. And as soon as they start to shop around and talk to doctors and things, then it gets to be more confused because if you show this in the films, you know, to 10 different surgeons, you'll get 10 different opinions. Okay. So what do I do? And you should probably know that. <clears throat> Um, the best treatment certainly for symptomatic stenosis without instability, without these vertebrae flopping around all over the place, is decompression surgery. Remove whatever that stuff is that squeeze and pinch in that nerve. Okay, we've got the capability of doing that, but what that does is almost immediately restores the blood flow back into the nerve. I can see it in surgery. I peel that back and the tissues like white, like my finger, the sack of nerves, and your white shirt, and I peel it back and you can see the blood flow coming back into it. I mean, it's really cool. And they wake up, invariably 85, 90% of the time, it's gone. And a couple hours later, they stand up, and they're waiting for the pain to come, and it doesn't come. So praise the Lord. <coughs> and this is what it looks like, okay? so. I'll tell you, first of all, that this, here is the spinous process bone, here's the spinous process bone. This is the space in between the lamina bone that's about the size of your fingernail, all right? That's where we do the surgery, and that's where this is. So, <clears throat> this is a little tiny one millimeter cutting instrument, and this tissue that I'm removing Remember on the MRI, I showed that big black wad of stuff? This is that black wad of stuff. And I want you to watch what comes out of here. As the sack of nerves, you can just see it popping through there, right there. Wow. That's only half of it. Wow. I didn't get the other side yet. Wow. Okay. So, even on the, under the micro or the thing, it's a big chunk of tissue. Yeah. And you can almost hear the nerves say, ah. <laughs> <laughs> and I did that by hardly removing any bone or I don't cut the muscle because the muscle's behind this retractor here. I cut the fascia of the muscle, which is the bag. So I stick my finger through there. So 
like sticking your finger through a strip stain, and create a keyhole, and the retractors go along the muscle, open up, and then a microscope comes in, and I can zoom down into that area, and then get all of this stuff done safely and effectively. Hmm. Now, uh, I talk about a lot of this stuff because I'm not just talking the talk, I'm not walking the walk. I happen to be one of the doctors, along with Dr. Arthur Steffi, who's a, my mentor, my partner, and he's considered the father of modern spine surgery. He invented the screws and the plates. And I was with him when all that happened, and I wrote the first paper about these things. It happens to be my name right there, and this was published in 1986. So I've been around the clock a bit times, okay? But um, because of that, um, I was very young, and I was interested in education. Dr. Steffi started the first spine implant company of the world called Acclimate Corporation, and he named the, uh, for me, a position on the advisory panel of the company. So he put me in charge of training all the surgeons in the world how to do all these new operations. I haven't even seen my own first patient yet, and I'm the world's expert <laughs> on this new great system that changed behavior, changed the way spine surgery was done. Traveled all over the world as a guest professor, you know. It was, it was quite the trip. I've done thousands of these operations, okay, thousands. And there's probably nobody, at one time there wasn't anybody more than me in the world that did more spondylolisthesis surgeries, okay. But, this is a panel of doctors he put together, and yours truly. This is Dr. Steffi more recently. He's still alive. Unbelievable guy. Um, but we were doing things like fusing the disc spaces because it has good blood supply, and why it's weight bearing, and so on and so forth. And these are the different approaches. These are, I have about you know, 14, 15 patents. This is one of them of the cage design to do all these operations. So you know, I've been there. Um, and these are the screws with the cages inside there, and it works great. It's the best thing for certain problems. But when we designed and developed all these things, we didn't develop them to treat, um, you know, degenerative conditions or arthritic conditions. It was major surgery, major trauma, burst fractures, uh, cancer patients, fusion surgeries that failed because they were all failing because there was no way that we could stabilize the spine. It was too mobile. The bones were um, but we didn't do it to do, treat, you know, degenerative disc disease. But surgeons started doing that because they found it was easy to do. And it seems like the right thing to do. And, uh, and it slowly became the standard of care, which it is even to this day, right? So, but I had a, um, I had a eureka moment where, and I'll go over that here in a second, as to why I moved away from fusion surgery to microsurgery. Um, in, in How many have been one of these seminars Sorry. before? Um, I apologize. <laughs> okay, so these are. Sure Thank you. Okay, um, but with, with all these surgeries being done, okay, there's over 3 million surgeries that are done in the United States, spine surgeries, a year. And statistics tell us that one in five patients will continue to have the same pain, a new pain, or recurrent pain. And if that's 300,000 a year, and we've been doing these things for at least 20 years, that's a lot of people who have what's commonly referred to as post-laminectomy syndrome, failed back surgery syndrome, painful hardware syndrome, chronic pain syndrome, fusion didn't take, Okay, and I can tell you that trying to fix these problems after they occur is not an easy operation. So, uh, I was with Dr. Steffi's group for a number of years until he retired in Cleveland uh, in 1997, which is when I got a call from the head of Cleveland Clinic and he said, you know, you've been a pain in my butt for 10 years. We don't have nobody at Cleveland Clinic doing what you do. I want you at the Cleveland Clinic. So that's how I ended up there. One of the things that I did is I set and established the Cleveland Clinic Center for Failed Back Surgery. Mm. Mistake. <laughs> <laughs> because a place like that, they get everything from everywhere that nobody else wants to take care of. But I happened to learn a lot from that um, and how.
how to take care of these people and what to do and what not to do. Like I say, I, I know how to get into trouble, I know how to get out of trouble, but I know how to avoid it. But most surgeons who are, confront, are confronted by patients like this, they don't. And they're intimidated and they're scared like hell to go in there because I can tell you, you can get into problems, major problems, real quick, operating on the space the size of your fingernail on the spine, right next to the spinal cord and the nerves and everything else. It's scary. So, but that's what I do. And even to this day, that's what one of the things that patients will come, literally, I have a national practice, they'll come from everywhere to see if there's a candidate, if they're a candidate for some of the stuff we're talking about. And we do a lot of that now through our website and doing Zoom consult. That's the only good thing about COVID is that it allows me and other doctors to do these consultations from near and far and, and uh, keep it well organized. Okay, if people had to come here from Texas or Minnesota or New York, they wish they do, uh, this is much better. And then we can arrange for them to come in and, and take care of whatever we need to take care of with them. <coughs> These are just some examples, okay? These are screws here. These screws don't belong where they're at. See where these are inside the bone? These are pulled out of the bone. Here's two screws. See that lucency around the screws? The bone has disappeared around the screw. It's called osteolysis. Um, and these screws today, the ones that are used, you see the head of that screw back here? That belongs way down here, at least in my opinion. And as they back out, they're sitting in the muscle. Here's the ends of the screws. Here's the big core muscles in your back, you know, the, the ones in the strip stakes. And these muscles are sitting right into those screws, rubbing over the heads of the screws. And it hurts like hell. And that's painful hardware syndrome. And you can see here, this is really doesn't make your day. Here's a screw that was supposed to be in the bone right there. It came out and it's going right through a nerve. Uh, in the canal, the spinal canal, and also over there too. So there's a lot of things that can constitute a failed back surgery syndrome. Okay, uh, nobody likes to talk about it or whatever, but there is hope, and there are some of us that can and do treat these things. Okay, but it's not enough just to do surgery, as there's so many other things that have happened to these people, their behavior. Addicted to, uh, to medication, deconditioning, sitting there eating all their field good food because they can hardly walk and they put on 50 pounds and everything else. Where they used to, you know, walk uh, 10 miles a day and you know ride their bikes and play golf and whatever. But another thing that it happens is that those big beautiful muscles can atrophy. I talked to Bella before that they, you saw that beautiful case here. You look at that muscle. Those are four core muscles. Look at this over here now. Mm -hmm. There's a posterior spinal muscle cell that's white in here. That's called fatty infiltration or um, muscle atrophy from a lot of various reasons. Okay. Um, whoops. I'll tell you about some medicine. Um, here's another example on both sides. Okay. Here's our spinal canal. The nerves look good. The facet joints, you know, some arthritis and stuff. But again, here's. You know, more and more until you get to a point like this where you hardly have any muscle left in your back. These are your big core muscles, and they're the ones when you bend forward, you know, and with any of these operations, at least that I do, you can get up right after surgery, bend over, and touch your toes. But to get back up, it's those muscles that gotta pull you up. And where I stuck my finger through them or whatever, they ain't gonna like that at all and they're gonna cramp, and they'll cause all the muscles around them, all their buddies to cramp, and that's the spasm from hell again, okay? So it's a fine line, you know, between you know, doing too much, doing too little, and in terms of some of the things that, we're, that we do for these. But this is very encouraging because there's no surgical treatment for this. I can't do a muscle transplant. I can't take on like they do sometimes for cancer or whatever, take a latissimus dorsi flap and move it around and cover that area. I can't, there's no pills that will make muscle grow. Muscle can grow, which is why we all go to the gym, make big muscles. Um, but 
in order to do in this case, you have to have the other <coughs> factors that go into why muscle can grow and become big and strong again. Things like growth hormone, growth factors, and all part of our immune system that somehow gets all combobulated once we hit 40, and these things have a hard time regenerating this tissue. We'll talk about that some more. Are there other options? Yeah. So that leads us then into what we've learned and what we're doing in this whole field of regenerative medicine. Okay. And that has to do with it's also called cellular medicine. Um, gene therapy, Peter platelet rich plasma, PRP, stem cells, growth factor, all these buzzwords that you hear today. <clears throat> and then the conditions that we're treating now is painful degenerative discs, okay, because again, the, where we started the whole conversation, we now have a way in 70% of cases where we can actually inject your own stem cells and the patient's own platelets. We'll talk about the difference between those two because it's a big difference. That can actually make that disc that is black and dark, again, look like this, okay, in, in all ages. Um, the uh, arthritis, we're inject injecting particularly the platelets of PRP. <coughs> PRP, think of it as the new cortisone. It's what all the sports medicine doctors, all the athletes are doing now. The closest one here is very famous. He's the Andrews Institute up in Pensacola. Dr. Jim Andrews, he takes care of the Saints, he takes care of Auburn, takes care of all the Olympic athletes. So whenever they get their strain, sprain, bruised bones, bad discs or whatever, they're putting all of these autologous patients own stem cells that we get from bone marrow and blood from, uh, with the platelets. It works. And you put cortisone, it does the exact opposite. So that's a very bad word for sports medicine doctors. Now when I say sports medicine doctors, I'm not talking about the surgeons who do it. They're medical doctors who do special fellowship training to take care of athletes. And they're the ones now that are the team physicians for a lot of the big sports teams and college pros, as well as high school. And, um, uh, and they are the ones that are really driving this whole field of regenerative medicine. They're using ultrasound imaging. They're actually diagnosing the conditions that you can't really see on MRI scans or CAT scans. But on their ultrasound, it's live. You're, you're actually seeing muscles move and everything. It's pretty cool. Um, and then they're using that same thing to take a needle filled with a syringe filled with PRP and putting it right into where that muscle is torn. And you can then get that muscle, that trigger point. If you ever had a trigger point injection, okay, that's what they're doing is put the, put the PRP right into that muscle. And lo and behold, 90% of the time pain goes away almost immediately. And it repairs the muscle. Okay, really good stuff. Um, <clears throat> Dr. Gregory Lutz, who's a very dear friend and unfortunately just passed away uh, this week, he's the founder and the head of uh, physical medicine and rehab at the Hospital for Special Surgery. So, you know, not a, uh, not a slouch a person. Uh, so, but he, he did the first study um, back and published in uh, 2016 just using platelet PRP alone in patients with painful degenerative discs. And it had significant improvement, in fact, so much so that the patients who were randomized into the non-PRP group, they switched over to the PRP, okay? This was another one of those shots heard around the world, in the spine world anyway, similar to the one we did with all the pedicle screws in place. <clears throat> so regenerative medicine, rapidly evolving field that harvests the power of the natural immune system to be able to treat a lot of these problems. And, uh, <clears throat> Uh, disclaimer, none of this yet is approved by the FDA for musculoskeletal problems, but PRP and bone marrow stem cells are approved for plastic surgery. All right, so the plastic surgeons got to jump on us, but it's all politics because, you know, if, if I can treat the arthritis in your knee with your own stem cells and your own platelets, and pain goes away and you're back on the golf course, you always ask yourself, if this works, who stands to lose? You know, Big Pharma, you know, they want to keep pushing those anti-inflammatory drugs and everything. Medical implant company 
they still want to sell the total knee replacements, and the uh, surgeons who do those operations are threatened because they're going to potentially lose business, rather than incorporating all that into their practices. So the FDA has, has asked for studies and gave us guidelines, and those studies have been done and completed and submitted with two-year follow-ups, and they're, they're saying, oh, that sounds great. We don't want to see five-year follow-ups now. So it's off-label, which means it's approved for one thing, so it's safe, it's efficacious, you're not going to die from your own stem cells and your own platelets. It's your own DNA. It's not somebody else's. It's not babies or whatever that they're, they're being killed or whatever. Or shooting, whatever. But um, we're working on it. Okay. So cell-based therapy before refers to platelets, lymphocytes, macrophages, and progenitor cells or stem cells. Okay. Stem cells are primitive cells in the embryo that at some point there's 13 different stem cell lines. They become all of the different systems, the cardiovascular system, nervous system, GI system, uh, skin, eyeballs, uh, and the musculoskeletal system. So the musculoskeletal stem cells are called mesenchymal cells or mesenchymal cells, as the Brits would say. This all came out of the same people in Glasgow, Scotland, that gave us Dolly the Sheep. Mm -hmm. So Dr. Bob Watson, Watson and Crick, cracked the DNA code, but they also found these little cells running around, didn't know what they were. So they harvested them, collected them, put them in a petri dish, and they started growing human muscle, human bone, whatever, and so they turned the, the, the name of the stem cells. And uh, so our progenitor cells are another common term. And it's a cell that can self-replicate, so it keeps going and going and going, because we're born with them, mostly in our bone marrow, but there's also cells in fat. Okay, so you like the suction, you can get mesenchymal cells from that as well. But again, it could be from bone, cartilage, muscle, fat, um, and it, it does a lot of other really good things. And we can get them from bone marrow, we can get them from fat, you can get them from your blood, because they're always circulating, going around looking for things to fix. But you can harvest them from individual organs. University of Miami had a program where the, you had an infarct in your heart, that, you know, from a heart attack, excuse me. They can do a biopsy of the heart muscle, grow it in a laboratory, bring it back in a month, and transplant the heart muscle back into the heart. So uh, this is, and you hear about in vita and um, the, uh, for cancer treatment, and the, the, doing all this genomic treatment, and they're genetically mapping the cancer cell. They're training the patient's own T killer cells, lymphocytes, leukocytes, macrophages to attack the cancer. So we're getting there. Orthopedics wise, we're doing a lot of this, still in the very early stages of our understanding. But almost every day it seems there's something new coming around. Other sources of cells, donors, cadavers, neonatal, fetal, um, you know, again, bone marrow. We talked about the mesenchymal cells, but there's also in bone marrow hemopoietic cells, so cells that can actually stimulate new blood vessel, I mean uh, new uh, uh, blood cell uh, types like the lymphocytes and the leukocytes and all of those that are our, our immune systems military. They're the ones attacking viruses and bacteria and all the stuff you heard about with COVID and everything else. And endothelial uh, stem cells which form new blood vessels. So again, it's all about getting blood to whatever we got to get it to and then get the stem cells or your immune system to do what it's capable of doing. We're only helping it out. So I'm a technician. I'm taking them from one place to another. Do you know all of the needles that would buy a needle? All of them with needles, okay? So what is PRP, platelet-rich plasma? You know, we get it from blood. And in, when you get a full uh, a CBC of a complete blood count, you know, in the laboratory, when you get your physicals and stuff, there's a, a section in there that is, is a platelet count, okay? And platelet, platelets um, contain our own natural anti-inflammatory cells, platelets, but they also contain growth factors, growth hormones, and are being used today instead of cortisone. So if you hurt yourself, pull this, stretch that, they'll take your blood, spin it down, get rid of the red blood cells, because we don't need those. It looks like liquid gold, and we concentrate, put them in a syringe, and we'll inject that into the injured area. Okay. It's amazing how well it works. Um, <coughs> is that what you do for a disc? 
That's one of the things that we do. In Dr. Lutz's study that I talked about, he did only PRP and through painful discs. And just the PRP, by stimulating the tissue that's already there, that's been damaged, to get them to grow, to root duplicate, and fill in the, the, the tears that have been created. Now, we'll talk about also, sometimes though, it's too advanced, or there's not enough of the, of the, of the disc tissue um, that, um, that can heal, then we'll put the stem cells into their, then the stem cells can become new disc tissue. Just but what, what's also in the platelets? A lot of Latin names. It does it, again, platelets are also important that if you cut yourself and you're bleeding, it, it, it along with fibrinogen and something called thrombin, which is a protein produced by, by damaged tissue. If you cut yourself, you bleed, and it stops and forms a scab, those are platelets, fibrinogen, and thrombin. And it's that same principle that we're using by being able to harvest all of those components of our blood to produce all of these different things. These are all growth factors and, and other elements that the platelet has that can do all these different things. Wound healing, resolution of, uh, I'm not sure, uh, tissue reorganization, new blood vessel formation, um, inflammation, and so on and so forth. So these little cells running around in your body, they're very, they control, they do everything that your immune system does, okay? So they're not just a bunch of cells that we just kind of throw away or don't know what they do. They're very, very important to our health and our survival and our longevity, you know? Because a lot of this is also being called now anti-aging medicine, okay? There's actually the American Academy of Anti-Aging Medicine, which is huge, thousands of doctors from around the world. They meet once a year in Orlando and they're going to Las Vegas and there's 20,000 doctors coming from all over and, and learning about all the things that are being done worldwide. Uh, in many cases, much more advanced than what we're doing here because of political and other restrictions. So, you know, we're still learning when to do PRP by itself. There are times we use bone marrow by itself. Times we combine the two of them. Every once in a while, we may use some donor tissue or donor cells like placental tissue or umbilical blood. Uh, FDA is all over that, though, and uh, I am a purist. I use your own. If it ain't your own, I don't use it, okay? Because you won't reject it. You won't overdose it from it. And if even I, I inject it in the wrong place, it ain't going to cause any harm, <laughs> all right? Enhanced PRP, we're now learning and have determined that a normal platelet count is like 200, 250,000 cells per cubic milliliter. We're concentrating into three to five million cells. So we're taking an extra amount of blood, spinning it down many times to make it super concentrated. And it also then contains some of these other components. One of them is called A2M, alpha-2 macroglobulin. You may have heard about this in the anti-aging literature or health literature. It's the anti-aging molecule. It's found in joints to preserve joints into uh, normal function and prevent further cell destruction and death. Uh, <coughs> leukocyte rich, we want a lot of white blood cells because they're the ones that are gonna go into our military. They're the first way they're gonna kill bacteria or anything else that's in tissue that we're gonna be treating. And then of course, fibrinogen is the microscopic snakes, snakes that plug the hole when you cut yourself. All of those are used inside the disc to create that seal and to allow the fluid then that starts to get pumped back in, provided that the vertebrae on either side are still fairly healthy. And then that's what re regenerates the nucleus, the cushion. Is it safe? Yes, it's safe. And the bone marrow we do right in our office. There's special instruments that we have now. Um, that can go into the pelvis um, and aspirate and harvest the bone marrow. The PRP, we just draw it from, from your blood, okay? And the conditions we're treating are painful degenerative disc and pretty much all the stuff we talked about before, muscle atrophy. And this is a patient, uh, an old patient of mine. This was an Air Force fighter pilot. No, I mean, I'm sorry, the Navy fighter pilot uh, going back to the Vietnam War flew F-4 Phantoms off of aircraft carriers 
these people are nuts. Uh, but you know, boom, all the compression and everything else. So it was just about every, well, in his particular case, the two bottom discs were, you know, pretty well gone, especially L5S1, discogenic pain. So this was April 2011, and people ask, you know, does it work? This is about a year, a uh, year and a half later. Now we see the white inside the disc base here and here. If this is a little bit darker, you can see it better. So this was actually my first case, which was exciting as heck. And within the first couple of weeks, his discogenic terrible pain was gone. And that's what uh, we're seeing more and more about, about 70, 75% of the time now. And of course, we've gone on to do many of these cases now. And uh, uh, we're following them. And um, there seems to be longevity. And the nice thing about this is you know, if it needs to be done again, Again, we can do one, we can do a hundred. Oh, his discs were compressed but not <coughs> permeated, is that right? Uh, they were torn. The outer angles was torn of doing this. And there were some herniations, yeah. So, herniations, they go away. 80% of them will go away if you just wait long enough. When do we operate? Two ways. If somebody comes in intractable pain, you know, they put a saw down, say, cut my leg off because it hurts so much or if there is evidence of nerve damage in the foot joint. I woke up this morning, I can't, I can't, I can't lift my foot. I walk around like that. Those are the only two times they'll say you need to have surgery and now. Other than that, if you can put up with the pain, then we're in pretty good shape. Okay, and this is another patient that we see. Uh, I mean, it's a little bit dark here, but this was 415. And about a year later, we did all these discs. And if you can see, it's hard to see in here, but all of these show increased uh, hydration. This one here, when you see this white bone like that, it's too late because those discs cannot produce the fluid to function to the disc space. Um, and this was a young 19-year-old girl, 20-year-old. She was a cheerleader at one of the big universities in the Midwest. And uh, they formed those big pyramids. You know, she was the top girl on the pyramid. Fell off, fractured her uh, pars. I'll put the vertebrae right here, right there. And, uh, and to, we treated her just with PRP. Uh, and no bracing or, no, she wore a brace, but you know, no, no screws or rods or anything. And it went on to complete fusion. So we're using this a lot for patients uh, who break their arms, break their legs, and it just won't heal, particularly in the lower leg, because a lot of those structures don't have uh, the blood supply. And this is a gentleman, 2014, came into my office, oops, one of my neighbors actually, um, essentially bone on bone on the inside of his knees, uh, scheduled for joint replacements, had just PRP without the bone marrow, and here he is a little over a year and a half later. Now there's a space in here, 16 months after the treatment. Uh, and again, the idea is to get back into the golf. Um, and um, that's another hope that we can talk about it if you're interested as well. And the two questions I have is how soon can I play golf? <laughs> and we <laughs> have sex. Uh, this is off of Amazon, actually. <laughs> That's a bad thing. We used to have uh, a whole box of these things. And people ask, well, here's the book. <laughs> and it's illustrated. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Craig, go ahead. Uh, and I think that uh, future ongoing research and harvest techniques, so on and so forth here. So if you've been told you need to have spine surgery or have had spine surgery with either persistent degenerative pain or know somebody who has, uh, one of the things that we're trying to do is offer second opinions, okay? There's no obligation or whatever, it's just like one of these things. And, um, you know, pass the word along and we'll be happy to talk to these people and folks and so on. So with that, I think we'll, I'd like to introduce somebody Okay, we just happened to have uh, one of my uh, patients that I just operated on yesterday. Oh, wow. John, you want to take it down here? Now, John's pretty cool. a walker because. Um, yeah, come on down. Come on down. She's in a walker because.
because every patient of mine has a walker right after surgery. Because when I'm in there monkeying around with all these nerves, even though they feel great and whatever, they uh, can hiccup and stop working. And like that, that leg will get up, he'll go down like a bag of bricks and break a hip. Yeah. That does not make my day or his day. So every patient for at least the first week gets a walker, the hospital gives it to him. I did that. It's glued to him wherever he goes. Now, we just left the hospital earlier. So, um, you guys got any questions for me? <laughs> <laughs> what was your main issue? Um, well, you can explain it better than I do. But I had, I've had, well, I've had both hips replaced, and I had um, chronic back pain forever. Saw a specialist in Naples who looked at my MRI and said, and I quote, dude, you've got a bad back for a guy your age. I'm like, well, that's helpful. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, stretching routines, um, <clears throat> chiropractor, tried lots of stuff, and then, um, we live in Naples, belong to Old Cypress. I was in the member member golf tournament about a month ago, and after day one, I had to pull out. I couldn't. And so, good friends of ours, uh, Shirley, had been uh, had five different surgeons look at her and said nothing we could do. She went to Dr. Biscuff a year ago, and now she's playing golf. And you wouldn't know if she had back trouble. So that, so after I pulled out of the golf tournament, I called. Shirley and said, okay, I need the name of your doctor. Uh, but I had a fracture. Um, What's that? <laughs> yeah, the, the picture he showed me after the surgery wasn't too pretty. Um, and so I had, I had a piece of bone floating around in there and then a cyst on top of the bone and all of that compressed the disc. So I had sciatica you know, down my left side and uh, he mentioned the drop foot I didn't have that, but I had a lot of tingling and <clears throat> numbness in my foot. Now, it, it's early, because I had the surgery yesterday, but I'm happy to report that's all gone. I wouldn't even know I had it, so I'm gonna put that in the wind column. But that was, the, that was, I couldn't, I just couldn't function anymore. I couldn't walk the dog, I couldn't, uh, I certainly couldn't golf, but um, when he, and so I did one of those consultations and we spent 90 minutes going through the MRI and here's what's going on and after that I'm like, okay, let's go. Did you have the blood cell? I did was not, no. TCP or what, what was that? I'm sorry? Did you use the blood transference thing? Uh, not yet, okay, because the main thing, the first thing that has to happen before anything happens, you got to unpinch the nerve. Because mm -hmm. if you go through the rest of this right. pinched nerve, sciatica, yeah. This, yeah. this regenerative stuff is it's a waste of time and money, okay? So we, if we, problems like his, fix the nerves first, we give them a good month, we have a whole program uh, planned out. It involves getting in a pool next week, right. water walking, yeah. physical therapy. Um, How did you fix the pinch nerve? Uh, like the microscope and going in there and pinch, pinch, pinch. And, and it was a pair. <laughs> it was very, very difficult because he, the, his whole joint, uh, else took care of, was broken. And so, and it was creating all this fluid and all the scar tissue and everything else that um, had, had to be removed. Yeah. And uh, a little bit of time because it's like feeling super glue on your fingers. You do that. Your fingers just sap the nerves, and you don't want to take the balloon with it, and you've got spinal fluid coming in and everything else. So fortunately, we didn't have any of that. So, um, so now it's just a matter of healing. And those nerves have got to quiet down because they don't know what the hell hit them. Yeah. And the muscles, too, from sticking my fingers through there. So people want to test it out. You know, you know, does it work? Does it don't work? Push it, yeah. Don't push it. I'll tell you when you can push it. He's told about 20 times BLT, no bending, lifting, or twisting. And then my wife Loretta, who's with me, has reminded me of that at least that many times. <laughs> <laughs> That's her job to do that. Yeah. So, are you doing surgery in Naples then, or was this in Sydney? No, I used to when I was, when the Cleveland Clinic, well, well, Regional Hospital used to be Cleveland Clinic. Um, and because I was a director of both in Westham and here. 
when the when the clinic sold the the hospital here, they they brought me back to uh, Weston, and but I still you know I still came and saw patients here. Uh, one of my very good colleagues of mine, uh, who used, was a former chief of staff at the clinic uh, Naples, Dr. Scott Madwar, uh, had an office right on Gulf Shore Boulevard, right across from Watermill Park. And the key word there was "had," um, and I time shared office space with him there. Uh, so we're looking now uh, to try to find. Can't find anybody who's willing to timeshare over here. It's all full-time leases or, or nothing. So we think we may have found one or two. So Sorry. yeah, for me, I did the MRI here, um, a stand-up MRI in Naples, and then sent that over uh, to West Palm, and then we did a Zoom consultation with the MRI, you know, kind of the split screen thing. Uh, so that's how we did it. But I did the MRI here. No insurance. The surgery was in in Jupiter, over in uh, West Palm. Yeah, over by West Palm. Did you have any insurance coverage for this? Uh, I did for the hospital. You know all the, the um, surgery expenses, anesthesia, anything dealing with the hospital. MRI, X-rays, all of that. Yeah, that was covered by insurance. Did you do any surgeries here in Naples at all? Where are you, where, I'm sorry, where are you going in? Where you That's just Jupiter Medical Center. Okay. Where? Jupiter Medical Center. It's, on, it's uh, 10 miles, 12 miles north of Palm Beach. Um, and it's the highest rated hospital now in Palm, Palm Beach uh, County and the second in all of South Florida behind Cleveland Clinic. Uh, it's a great hospital. It's growing leaps and bounds. Uh, many, many patients from here will come over, have their surgery done there, and they'll stay overnight. And then if they're doing well, then you know, head back here the next day and off we go and everything else is done here. Yeah, they're, they are pretty amazing. We, so we went over Tuesday, had a consultation with the doctor for that afternoon, and I got a hotel near the hospital Tuesday night and then, and then Wednesday night. So we left <coughs> noon today, I think we started driving back. It's about two and, two and a half hours. And I'm being Nurse Ratchet, so he needs to exit. That's Loretta. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. She's making me sit down. So. <laughs> no, I'm making him go. Yeah, you need to go. <laughs> appreciate that. John, appreciate you. Yeah, yeah. you got it. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Very nice. And just so happens we have another patient who's not one day, but one month or two months? And seven weeks. Seven weeks. Seven weeks. This is Colleen. Hi. I am super excited to share with you because, first of all, he's amazing. Um, I saw four different neuro slash orthopedic surgeons from 2017 until January this year. All four told me I had confusion. Okay. I saw four different uh, neurosurgeon slash orthopedic surgeons in the Cleveland Clinic and UH area. This is Cleveland, Ohio. That's where I'm from, down in Naples uh, during the winter. And uh, every surgeon, February 23rd, 2017, that was the start date, you need a fusion, you need it now. And I refused to do surgery because I didn't believe that. I thought I could heal it myself. I knew I had three herniations, I had arthritis, I had a spondylolisthesis, grade one, blah, blah, blah. Turns out I had a lot more than that. But anyhow, I put it off, I put it off, I did every kind of holistic healing modality that you can name. I guarantee, you could raise your hand and tell me something you've done, I did it, because <laughs> I was all about fixing this myself. I was in chronic pain, I could not, I was, I've actually been on crutches since October. So I'm crutches since October, and it just got to a point where I was beyond depressed, because my lifestyle had gone from super active to literally nothing. I couldn't walk across the kitchen, I couldn't cook, I couldn't drive, I couldn't, really couldn't do anything. My life had just, the only thing I could do was ride a bike, go figure. Rent really? over, <laughs> no pressure on my spine if I could ride a bike. And, but walking, forget about it. So, um, you know, and I have a very active lifestyle. So the depression hit me hard, and I just started cycling again in, I think, uh, October last year, I met this company called Be Naples Bello, where, like him, I met somebody who had surgery five years ago and insisted he didn't have to have a fusion, but when he rattled off his list of what was wrong, I'm like, wow, that sounds really similar to me. So I asked him for the name, got the referral, and I met Dr. Biscuit by the grace of God. He had a, a, a meeting not too far off. It was in January. And then he had a cancellation, so I just slotted right in. Now, here's the thing. Turns out, everything they told me that was wrong wasn't what was wrong. Mm -hmm. That's the part that's crazy. 
So that whole, in fact, he and I sound very similar. Okay, a broken facet, both pieces were broken, synovial cyst, I had broken or torn an annulus, and so I had all these calcifications inside my spinal canal, in addition to a ton of arthritis. I knew I had that, and some other kind of like yummy, gross stuff that was in there that he told me about. And, I, and my flabrum ligamentum was three times the normal size. Now I knew I had stenosis, I get right off the terms. When, when I was reading this, I'm like, oh my gosh, I have all of those things. I did have a very nice spine that self-corrected. I was supposed to have a fusion because of my alleged spondylolisthesis. Now this is with forward, backward, four MRIs, forward, backward, x-rays, the whole shebang, and all these, all these surgeons said I had to have a uh, fusion. And I was terrified, but I was scheduled for a top appliance in April, April 30th this year until I met Dr. Biscuit. Saw him, had surgery a week later, stood up pain-free that day. Can I tell you, it's like winning the lottery. I never realized how depressed I really, I mean, I knew I was depressed, but man, once you don't have pain again, it's like you have a whole new lease on life. So um, obviously I'm sitting here for that reason because I can't say enough great things about him. Uh, compared to the amount of time that he spends, clearly he's brilliant. He's gonna educate you. He's gonna get really clear with what's wrong and help you. So I could talk for 10 hours. I didn't even thought I want that for that long. But, um, what you used to do. What I used to do, which part? Uh, his personal <laughs> pain? Yeah. Which part? Your occupation or so, well, I was a personal trainer, and I used to do a lot of different weightlifting, but I also do mental mindset training. So which part do you want to talk about? <laughs> 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 yeah. The training, the training, exercise. A lot of compression training, boxing, gymnastics, you know, you name it, I did it. Um, skiing, and I would jump in skiing, so it was a lot of heavy compression. But, you know, I really believe that I would take barbells with pendulum swings, and get into a lunge position and do rows. But I also did golf, and I did pickleball, I did all those things. So who knows, I mean clearly this was an injury from like December of 16, I was in the hospital February 17. Something I did twisting with weight is what broke those facets. And they've been sitting in there for almost seven years until he discovered them. Meanwhile, not one person told me that was wrong. So I might, and it's, it's sad, because I really did like those other people, but I just didn't trust intuitively. I knew this isn't what I should do. So I just can't. Thank you enough. I just can't. Well, my husband is so happy. <laughs> He's been miserable with me. What did you have done on her that you didn't explain what was oh. done? The video that I showed? Yeah. Okay. Pretty much all of it. So she put it out. The nerve yes. release. What's the procedure called? It's called a micro decompression okay. laminotomy. Yes. Okay. <laughs> uh, we have all that information. So, one of the questions people ask me okay, this is such a great operation. Why aren't there more surgeons doing it? You know, thinking it's some kind of a scam or whatever. It's a very difficult operation, not just to do, but to learn to do. Now, when I was at Cleveland Clinic training all the young doctors and the residents and fellows, and then down here, I was actually the fellowship director. I trained them to do it. Um, but even them were intimidated because if they get in trouble, they know what can happen. So, um, uh, so to, even to this day, there are other surgeons who do it, okay? But it's a, it's a handful of us. But the question people will often ask too, well, if it's, uh, you know, okay, that's great, it goes away, but what's the longevity like? You know, how long does it last? Do they have to go back after every year? Or just so happen to have another person here who is... Craig. <laughs> <laughs> it's been at least eight years, I don't know. It's been about five, six, seven, eight years. Yeah. Okay, Craig Manchin, stand up. <laughs> He's a world-class cyclist, and this guy and a group of his buddies, you know, what, 10,000 a year? 10,000. 10,000 miles a year on a bike, does uh, Iron Man's, does all kinds of other State stuff. champion. So, <laughs> and, um, but so, then you say, so he, he did the same thing for me. I was, I was in such pain. I mean, I couldn't do anything. I, 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 could, I could bite like Colleen, but that would be it. And um, it got to the point where it was just so horrible. I, I, you know, I, I found a person that knew Dr. Biscup. And I, I called Dr. Biscup and he looked at my MRI and knew what to do. And, I said, please just do it tomorrow, and, and he did, and I, I'm, I'm perfect. I mean, it's, it's really nice, so thank you, Dr. Bissett. Thank you, Craig. Great guy, a great inspiration, too, for me as well as, you know, other patient, friends and patients of his that he sent over to me, and they're, at some point, I think I got a charter bus to hear about that. So, okay, questions? Question, question here. Yep. Um, what would be uh, our Contraindication, or when someone would not be a candidate 
for the micro decompression laminoplasty? When they would not be a candidate for the procedure. Um, Is age a factor or no, health? No, uh, and I'll tell you another story real quick here. Uh, there really isn't. Um, now, patients will tell me sometimes that uh, doctors say, yeah, they have to have a fusion, but they're concerned because if they put the screws in and you have osteoporosis or osteopenia and your bones are soft, uh, I showed you some examples of what happens to those screws, okay? So I will see a lot of patients who have been diagnosed with severe stenosis, told they need to have a fusion, nothing else can be done. And I said, I can help you. I mean, this is what we do. And we and have many, many patients who we've done the surgery, you know, weak bones and all that kind of stuff. And, uh, and they do just as well. Plus then afterwards, we can get them in an exercise program, get them on medications to start building their bone strength back up. And there's some very good ones today with Forteo and with uh, Prolia and some of these newer ones. Um, so infection probably would be one if you had an abscess or an infection uh, or infected vertebrae or whatever. It doesn't, take, uh, it doesn't take you out of the picture. You just gotta clear up the infection first, then I can help you. But if, uh, say, say it is L4, L5, that there was uh, a long existing lateral scoliosis, that would not preclude that they wouldn't be a candidate for this? No, scoliosis, you know, again, it's one of the S words. You know, stenosis, synovial cysts, <laughs> scoliosis, bombobolisthesis. It's a vertebrae that has, I showed examples how it's collapsed on one side and it closes that opening where the nerve is coming out. So surgeons say the only way you can fix that is to put screws in and jack it apart, straighten out your scoliosis that you probably have had for 60 years yeah. and it's already fused. Yeah. It's, it's not a practical operation, but unfortunately I do see patients that have had that done and if they're not pretty pictures and they're not very happy patients. So, you know, part of my mission is to help people not get to that point because so many times the surgeons, they get, they get tunnel vision and see the scoliosis, oh, you gotta fix the scoliosis. No, you just fix the stenosis just like I do in a perfectly straight spine and lo and behold, the nerve pain goes away, blood flow comes in, I do it so I can rotor root out that opening so that the nerve has enough room to go through. And then we're looking at the atrophy muscle and all that kind of stuff. We're using their own platelets and stem cells to treat that. So it's a whole different game today. And it's catching on. It's the future of medicine. It's just that there's just a lot of you know, pushback. Somebody over here, head up. Yes, sir. I've had two back surgeries that are right here in Naples. OK. I've had a place where now the bridge collapsed. I don't know what else to do anymore. I, I, I played tennis for 50 years. I can't move hard anymore. Is there something you think you can do for me? Give us a second opinion. Yeah. yeah. Uh, what, what's the next procedure? What do we do? Check with the girls in the background. I already did. Okay. Well, did you have any more ideas you do? No, this has been six years ago I had this all done. Okay. That's what I'm asking. We get another MRI. We need to get x rays, okay, with you standing and all that kind of stuff. We need to get an MRI and we may want to get a CAT scan. Yeah. Okay, because they all give us different information. Now, either your family doctor or your internist can order those. Tell them you saw me, that you're sending them to get a second opinion, and he can already order those for you. Um, and uh, we, you know, we can recommend my stand-up MRI for the MRI, and the CAT scan x-rays, you can get that at any of the hospitals or the outpatient, or, you know, ProScan is another one. They'll give them to you on a disc, Okay, uh, FedEx the disc to me. Uh, once we get it, um, then we call and we'll schedule a Zoom uh, telemedicine or just a phone telemedicine. Or if you want to schlep over to Palm Beach, we can do it over there. Um, and I'll tell you, you know, what I think is a problem, what I can do to help you. I, I don't put much hardware in anymore. I take a ton of it out. Yeah. Yeah. I got a whole box of screws and whatever. <laughs> Now most patients want them as souvenirs. Uh -oh. <laughs> one lady took the pedicle screws and a machinist cut a hole and put a loop in it and she made it. Uh -oh. <laughs> <laughs> some of these, you'd be amazed how big they are. I mean, I showed you some of them, the heads of those screws. 
they're literally, you can feel them sticking out of your back. Yeah, it's like my knee. And, uh, you know, there's the buzzword today is minimally invasive surgery. Okay, what 90% of that is, is minimally invasive fusion surgeries. And they're figuring out ways that they can put screws into the spine through a tube and the rod and so on and so forth and a cage into the disc space, but it's not decompressing the nerves. You're still gonna have to open it up and do it or whatever. So, um, you know, again, there's, there's many, many ways to approach this. And again, being around for 30, almost 39 years now, 10,000 plus cases, I guess it makes me an expert. Um, I developed that operation, the microsurgery. And so, uh, as I said, I, I know how to get into trouble, out of trouble, but to avoid it. And if I say, I, I don't think I can help you, I can't help you. What uh, percentage of people that. aren't you able to help? What's that? What percentage of people aren't you able to help? Not much. <clears throat> Maybe 10%. Could usually find, aha, there it is. Just like with Colleen, I, I saw that cyst and I saw the fracture, and I think he even mentioned it, that I wouldn't be surprised when I get in there and see a fracture. Well, she broke the whole damn joint. Uh, with no weight or whatever. And, uh, um, so I, I know what to look for. Um, and I have a concierge practice, okay? So I don't take insurance or Medicare because a chairman of the department of Cleveland Clinic, both in Cleveland and down here, and by the fourth year I was down here, I had the second highest profit center in the whole Cleveland Clinic system, and that's with spine orthopedics. And um, I was so busy, I was seeing 15 to 20 new patients a day, two days a week, doing surgery two days a week with two rooms, Two teams, I was at two fellows, I was doing eight to ten of these surgeries a day, bouncing from room to room to room, with the nurse telling me this is such and such, this is what you're doing, this is what you're doing. And I hated it because I, I didn't want my career to end like that, all the stuff that I've been able to do and accomplish, and it wasn't about the money or anything, it was just it was killing me. So uh, I literally had four minutes to come in tell you what your problem was, what I can do, then move on to the next patient. And there's a pinhead out there with a stopwatch. Do you have go by? Dr. Biscuit, you get an emergency phone call. Extra minutes. That's, that's the question. So, and that's all the big medical centers, whether it's Cleveland or New York or Special Surgery or Johns Hopkins, I don't care. They're all big teaching hospitals. Yeah. Teaching hospitals, you gotta teach. And the young doctors have to learn how to do these surgeries. So one of the questions people always ask me, I go through this whole thing with everybody. I schedule all my new patients for an hour. The Zoom calls, in, you know, if you came to the office or whatever, you get an hour. And you get my personal cell phone number. So you have 24 hours access to me. You got a question, you don't call the nurse or you don't call the answering service, you call me directly. If I don't pick up, just leave a message, I'll get right back to you. 